Originally appearing as a one-off sidekick, the character of Harley Quinn has since gone on to become one of comic books' most popular and enduring characters. Jim Lee, publisher and chief creative officer of DC Comics at the time of this video, once referred to Harley as the fourth pillar in our publishing line, behind Superman, Batman and Wonder Woman. After her first film appearance in 2016's Suicide Squad, as played by Margot Robbie, fans of Harley have had plenty of versions of Harley to choose from over the last few years, but most notably in Robbie's follow-up, Birds of Prey and the fantabulous emancipation of one Harley Quinn, and in DC Universe's animated streaming series, Harley Quinn. Both projects are fun, colourful and wonderfully outlandish interpretations of the character and of Gotham City, but neither shy away from the darker, more personal side of Harley, that makes her so much more than just a supervillain's number two, deep diving into her relationships with the Joker, Poison Ivy, and most importantly, with herself. Expect a clown car full of spoilers for Suicide Squad, Birds of Prey, and DCU's Harley Quinn to follow. Harley Quinn first appeared in 1992, not in the comic book, but on Batman the Animated Series, in the episode Joker's Favor. She was originally intended as a homage to the Adam West Batman series, as explained by writer on the animated series, Paul Dini, to The Hollywood Reporter. As I was putting together the story, I thought, what about giving the Joker a girl in the gang this time and referencing the Adam West series? They had the Riddler, Joker, Penguin with their own hench girls. Her appearance was further inspired by a Days of Our Lives dream sequence that saw actress Arlene Sorkin appear in a Jester costume. As according to Dini, I was homesick and had the TV on, and there she was on Days of Our Lives playing a Jester in a fantasy sequence. I saw her running around in a Pied Piper outfit, and I thought, that's kind of cute. Sorkin would voice the character, as she and Dinny had been friends since college, and Harley immediately became a lasting presence on the series, developing quickly into the Joker's love-struck sidekick. Mark Hamill, who voiced the iconic animated Joker, said on Twitter, in the script, she was just an unnamed Joker henchwench with no discernible personality. When Arlene began reading her lines in that unforgettable voice, so poignant and full of heart, I nearly fell off my chair. <coughs> Here's to Gotham's Commissioner G. You lock up the weirdos, the crooks, and the geeks. But this time, baby, the joke's on you. She would appear in some comic books based on the animated series, including the notable 1994 special, The Batman Adventures Mad Love, which told the story of Harley's origin. Mad Love introduced readers to psychologist Harleen Quinzel, who would attempt to treat and rehabilitate the Joker at Arkham Asylum, to find herself becoming corrupted by him instead, transforming into the Harley Quinn we now know. Mad Love would go on to receive the Eisner and Harvey Awards for Best Single Issue Comic of the Year. Harley would be officially introduced into actual DC Comics canon in 1999's No Man's Land event. Comic Harley shared her origin story with her animated predecessor, and soon received a solo series in 2000, which ran for 38 issues. The series saw her set out on her own, separate to the Joker after he betrayed and tried to kill her, and this development would set the overall trajectory for Harley's future as a character. She would go on to form partnerships with other female villains like Catwoman and Poison Ivy, drifting further into anti-hero territory in books like 2009's Gotham City Sirens, a brief but informative series for Harley that was written by Dinny and whose clear influence can be seen in 2020's Birds of Prey and DC Universe's Harley Quinn. Following DC's New 52 reboot of its comic continuity in 2011, Harley's appearance was revamped, seeing her lose the Jester look and replace it with her now infamous multicolored ponytails, crop tops and short shorts, and made a member of the Suicide Squad for the first time. Harley has since appeared in games such as the Arkham and Injustice titles, numerous television series and of course on the big screen, and her popularity has been undeniable. Former DC co-publisher Dan DiDio said about her time in the 2011 Suicide Squad series that Harley covers sold better than any of the other characters, and the best-selling paperback collection of issues was the one that captured her origin story. So when we saw that she had some real interest, and the more we put her in the book, the better the book did, it seemed to generate some sensibility for us, saying, there's more there. Kevin Kinnery, vice president of DC Collectibles, has referred to Harley as always a top seller, who can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Batman and the Joker as one of the most fan-requested and sought-after characters. And even in Suicide Squad, Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn is easily the best thing about the film. She comes at the role with all that manic energy and ecstatic, playful penchant for violence that characterizes her. According to David Fear of Rolling Stone, there's a sick giddiness to the way she relishes her acting out every violent tendency that pings through her crosswired cranium, a reveling in her villainy, what every member of DC's Dirty Half Dozen should be doing. Huh? What was that? I should kill everyone and escape? Sorry. The voices. Robbie's appearance in Suicide Squad would mark the beginning of Harley's true surge into more mainstream media, 
as the character was soon announced to be starring in three separate projects. A Suicide Squad sequel, Gotham City Sirens, and a joint Joker and Harley project. Gavin O'Connor, the director of Ben Affleck thriller The Accountant, was attached to write and direct Suicide Squad 2, while David Ayer was to direct Gotham City Sirens, which would have focused on characters like Catwoman, Poison Ivy, and of course, Harley. Directors Glenn Ficarra and John Requa were at one point attached to the Harley Joker film, which was reportedly to have featured Jared Leto's Joker. Eventually, Suicide Squad 2 would become the upcoming The Suicide Squad, still starring Robbie as Harley, but directed instead by Guardians of the Galaxy's James Gunn. The Harley Joker spin-off has so far faded away quietly, especially following Wacken Phoenix's hit in Joker and Warner Brothers' apparent distancing of themselves from Leto's portrayal. As these projects changed and shifted, there was one that had been in the making for roughly five years that finally made its way into cinemas just before the world shut down. Birds of Prey and the fantabulous emancipation of one Harley Quinn. Birds of Prey was initially pitched by Margot Robbie herself, after discovering just how passionate the fandom for her character was during the press tour for Suicide Squad. As she told Nerdist, During Suicide Squad, when we go to Comic-Con and such, I started to realise that there was just such a huge fan base for Harley. According to Birds of Prey screenwriter Christina Hodgson, his credits also include Bumblebee and, as of writing this video, the upcoming Flash movie, Robbie had pitched the idea of doing this movie to the studio in the summer of 2015. Obviously that was a bold idea because Suicide Squad hadn't even come out yet. Birds of Prey would eventually become the first superhero movie both written and directed by women, as well as the first female-led R-rated superhero film, which made it quite the project to get off the ground. Robbie told Nerdist, Even the quickest movie-making process can be at least three years, I reckon. But this one, it took a little longer, it was a tall order. It was before anyone had done an R-rated comic book film. I was saying, I want to do an R-rated film. It was before Wonder Woman and I was saying, I want a female-led action film. You know, those things weren't being done yet. But Birds of Prey wouldn't be the only version of Harley Quinn to be found on screens in 2020, and audiences could find Kaylee Cuoco's take on the character in the animated series produced by DC Universe, which launched on the streaming service in November 2019 and aired its first two seasons over the next eight months. The series was created by Justin Halpern, Patrick Schumacher and Dean Laurie, and came about at least in part due to the cancellation of NBC's Powerless, a short-lived sitcom set in DC's superhero universe which the trio had written for and executive produced. Ron Funches, who appeared first in Powerless and then as King Shark in Harley Quinn, said regarding the former show's lack of superheroes and the writer's response, People were like, we don't like that. So they were like, we're gonna try it again, but with, like, superheroes this time. Like Birds of Prey, DCU's Harley Quinn is foul-mouthed, cartoonishly violent and takes constant satirical aim at the entire DC roster of characters. Incorrect. The Steelers have won the most games at Gotham Stadium. I'm gonna blow up Gotham Stadium. Very much not a superhero show for kids. Quentin, what, what the fuck are you doing? You're not supposed to take his face off yet. I had this covered. Yes, well, I, I thought of that great plus one line and then I'm not going to not puppeteer his face. <laughs> but its unique voice would certainly make Harley Quinn stand out. Quoco told Conan O'Brien, Well, when I first read the first script of that, I thought it was a joke. I said, well, we can't, you can't say these things. I can't say these. I mean, it was so outrageous and graphic. Um, and they said, no, it's DC. You could, you, we can say anything. And so they just let me be psycho. The show would soon become one of the most definitive explorations of the character and was described by Robin Barr of The Hollywood Reporter as one of the best surprises of the year. There's an overall surprising degree of personal investment that went into both projects and the result can definitely be seen in the final products. Christina Hodgson told Variety about developing Birds of Prey's story alongside Robbie, I was at the keyboard, she was doing story cards. She is remarkable in that sense. I certainly don't know of any other actors like her who would do that. And regarding the other numerous hardly focused projects that had been announced prior to Birds of Prey, Robbie had told Movie Phone that she wasn't a part of those. I was focusing on this. I kept presenting it to the studio until they felt it as at a point where they were ready to do it. And now we're all in. In the same way that Birds of Prey had been a personal project for Margot Robbie to get off the ground, Kaylee Cuoco had a direct investment in Harley Quinn beyond simply starring. Cuoco launched Yes Norman Productions in 2017, alongside producer Susan McCormack, and together had signed a multi-year deal with Warner Brothers TV to develop original projects, like the critically well-received The Flight Attendant, and led to Cuoco becoming an executive producer on Harley Quinn, as well as its star. Harley Quinn would be the new production company's first credit, making it an obviously personal project for Cuoco. And as with Birds of Prey and the obvious radish that Margot Robbie takes in inhabiting Harley, the level of investment carried over into the performance. Co-showrunner Patrick Schumacher told Entertainment Weekly, When we were trying to find the voice of the character, she went back and re-recorded entire episodes to get it right. She's so enthusiastic about this character. Both Birds of Prey and Harley Quinn have an incredibly strong sense of visual style. 
each presenting a world that is very much defined by Harley's perception and point of view, filtered through the colourful, manic lens of the character. It's Harley's world, and everyone else just happens to live in it. Producer Sue Kroll said regarding Birds of Prey, Harley obviously is very unique, right? Her point of view on the world is very specific. So imagine you're looking at the world through her eyes and her rationale and reason. That's where the spirit of the movie comes from. Visually, this is represented with something reminiscent of Suicide Squad style, but tailored more specifically to Harley, complete with voiceover and a dyslinear narrative that showcases Harley's own wandering attention span and inability to sit still and focus. Hold up, hold up. I'm telling this all wrong. Let's rewind. Even the hyperkineticism of the film's action sequences, which are filmed with the aid of John Wick director Chad Stahelski and his team at 8711, do a lot to continuously escalate the heightened, stylized reality of Harley's world. In the animated show's case, Harley's childish and naive outlook is reflected in the portrayal of Gotham around her, where supervillains go on talk shows and care as much about branding as they do world dominance, publicly distancing themselves from villains like Dr. Psycho for being too politically incorrect. That really hurt, you c we cannot condone Dr. Psycho's use of the C-word, as it does not represent our brand of evil. As Schumacher said about the show, from the get-go, the pitch was this show is from Harley's perspective. Gotham is going to be a lot brighter and more technicolor, because this is through her eyes. The silliness is played up to 11, directly juxtapositioning the extreme, fantastical nature of these characters with the mundanity of day-to-day -day existence. And we're murdering everyone in Gotham in three, two... And in a way, that's a perfect encapsulation of the character of Harley. She was born from a cartoon, and her attitude and portrayal generally reflects that. But at the same time, she deals with very normal and human problems, especially regarding her deeply complicated relationships with the Joker, and later with Poison Ivy. And that's where there's always been an interesting twist to Harley. In the grim world of Gotham City, Harley is fun, armed with either a giant hammer or a trusty baseball bat, quirky at the best of times and manically violent at the worst. She often brings a levity that Batman properties especially are normally lacking. But then she's also a character laden with uncomfortable darkness, most notably in her relationship with the clown prince of crime himself. Possibly Harley's earliest defining trait was her obsessive love for the Joker, along with his inability to ever reciprocate. The Joker is consistently dismissive and manipulative of her love for him in order to get her to do what he wants, more than happy to toss her out a window if it serves his purposes. Beneath the manic pixie clown girl exterior, Harley is a starkly human character stuck in a cyclical relationship of violence and suffering with a man who will never love her back and who will never change. It was him all along, wasn't it? It's always been him. <laughs> it's something so darkly uncomic booky and a complicated relationship to try and depict, absolutely integral to Harley's evolution to a solo anti-hero or anti-villain, but it also shouldn't be the be-all and end-all of her character. And that's one of the things that DC Universe's Harley Quinn does so well. The first season primarily tells the difficult story of how hard it is at first for Harley to move forwards, and as said by executive producer Jim Halpern, the idea is that we've all been in relationships with someone that we felt wasn't right for us, all the way to someone that was toxic for us, and how you extricate yourself from that is really what this show is all about. It actively confronts the ways in which the Joker, voiced by the always incredible Alan Tudyk, took advantage of her, the gaps he made in her armour and the ways in which he has manipulated her, down to the painful moments where she becomes so confident that she's risen above him, and yet finds herself played and betrayed one too many times. Some things never change, Quinn. But Harley's mission statement for the show as a whole is all about creating her own identity, both as her own supervillain, but also just as Harley. It shows her learning how to move on and define who she is as her own person, along with all the emotional ups and downs that that involves. Even when the Joker inevitably resurfaces in Season 2, it's to demonstrate how he no longer has any power over her. Harley is at first just content to leave the amnesiac former supervillain be, a clear demonstration of her own emotional growth thus far. But when she needs to restore his memories to save those she cares about, she does what she has to do, but also immediately proves that she'll take zero shit from him. And from there, the show pushes the dynamic to a place it has never been before in the Batman mythos, where the active confronting of their relationship causes it to evolve into something somewhat platonic, or at the very least, non-adversarial. As cathartic as Harley bashing in the Joker's head can always be, 
This evolution in their relationship says more about Harley's growing emotional maturity than it does about any redemption for the Joker. So is this your new life? You're gonna go coach a little league team and get ice cream after the game? <laughs> no! Little Benicio is lactose intolerant. Look! Lots of dads are serial killers! Birds of Prey, unlike the animated show, doesn't feature the Joker at all, going as far as to cut around Jared Leto during flashbacks taken from Suicide Squad. The film starts with her and the Joker already separated, and just like in the DCU animated series, wastes no time in establishing her desire to forge her own identity, whilst also dealing with the consequences of being with someone like the Joker, and establishing relationships based on trust rather than violence. Just like with any major breakup, Harley needs space. Robbie also stated that it was either going to be a complete Harley and Joker story, or Joker has got to be out of the picture. This iteration of Harley obviously follows on from Suicide Squad, where the relationship as depicted between the two colourful criminals drew some criticism. It's worth mentioning up front that, according to sources like The Hollywood Reporter, Suicide Squad went through absolute production hell. The film was announced in October 2014 with a release date less than two years away. A tight turnaround which, combined with the less than stellar response to Batman vs Superman, and a trailer that had promised the fun of Guardians of the Galaxy in contrast to the film's supposed actual tone, made Warner Brothers nervous, and prompted them to commission a new cut of the film. This new edit came from Trailer Park, the company behind the poppy teaser trailer and eventually the studio found a compromise between the two cuts that leaned closer to trailer parks than Ayers. At this point, it's incredibly unclear how closely the final product resembles what director David Ayer and the team behind the film initially envisioned for Harley. Though David Ayer tweeted in April 2020 that, sadly her story arc was eviscerated. It was her movie in so many ways. In the end result, the complexity of the character is basically lost in the noise of the rest of the movie. Her relationship with the Joker is presented as much more a Bonnie and Clyde type situation, a pair of deranged lovers against the world. There are elements of the storyline, specifically in some of the flashbacks, that set up the darker relationship between the two that's more in line with the character's history. And even her reunion with him at the movie's end isn't all that dissimilar from the ending of the original Mad Love. But once the real action of the film begins, Joker's only goal is to get Harley back, taking a lot of the bite out of any of his earlier betrayals. By having the Joker keep saving Harley throughout the film, from the acid bat to the helicopter escape, which itself then feels like the two being tragically separated, the film straddles this odd line of justifying the relationship, and, by extension, her going back to him. In Mad Love or the pilot of Harley Quinn, the Joker's discarding of Harley is much more direct and a much more conscious choice that drives home to Harley the Joker's true nature. I couldn't possibly let this punctuation prick hey. get credit for killing Batman, now could I? Free the bat! Drop the broad! and there's a moment that Suicide Squad is missing, potentially due to the many re-edits. Harley joining the squad for real ends up not feeling like an actual choice of her own, more like her only option after the Joker's apparent death whilst rescuing her, which is an important distinction when it comes to the agency of a character like Harley. And by the sounds of it, Aya's original cut of the film would have touched on the relationship in a much darker way, especially based on leaked behind the scenes footage. Coming out of the shadow of the Joker, Birds of Prey enjoy showing Harley going through all the classic cinematic beats that follow a breakup, albeit dialed up to 11 in ways that can only happen in Gotham. Just replace getting drunk and unfollowing your ex on social media with getting drunk and blowing up a chemical plant, and adopt a hyena. According to Christina Hodgson, so many people spend money they shouldn't after a breakup, so we had Harley buy a hyena because of course she'd buy a hyena. Harley's such a heightened character, but we also wanted her to feel universal. But beyond the montage of breakup tropes, the film shines in depicting Harley as she strives to stand on her own, using her own skill set. I know the East End better than anybody. You want this diamond back? I'm your gal. Her own physical prowess. <laughs> and her own intelligence. You know, psychologically speaking, vengeance rarely brings the catharsis we hope for. Namely in order to survive the countless enemies she has unwittingly unleashed on herself, by no longer being associated with the Joker and, by extension, his protection. Hodson told Bustle, I wanted the audience to see Harley Quinn standing on her own two feet. Her motivation has always been in service to this other character. A Harley Quinn's role is to serve an audience, a master, both Birds of Prey and DCU's Harley Quinn remember that before she was the Joker's Harlequin, she was Harley and Quinzel, a genius psychiatrist in her own right with her own violent tendencies that set her on a path to villainhood long before she met the Joker. And remembering the character's intelligence is a big deal, since it's fair to say that Harley has long been a very sexualized character over the years. 
Even her original animated appearance has Harley trying and failing to get the Joker's attention physically, especially with the infamous line, Don't you want to rev up your Harley? Vroom, vroom! <laughs> One of the biggest criticisms laid at Suicide Squad's feet was its physical depiction of Harley, especially when the trailers made sure that some of the first images viewers got of Robbie's Harley focused solely on her body. Her costume is full of references as to how she belongs to the Joker, and her body is ogled by the camera like no one else in the film. Harley embodied the crazy hot chick, as explained by Sci-Fi Wire's Jessica Toomer. You know, one men fantasize about, one they dream of controlling, or worse, enticing further into madness. She's attractive because of her mental illness. She's naughty enough to fulfill some of your darkest desires. Her insanity is part of the seduction. It means you can view her as an object, not a human being, as long as it doesn't spill over into territory not involving sex. And while the films of the Marvel Cinematic Universe have generally been more than happy to offer up at least one scene per film where the male hero smoulders shirtlessly towards the camera, they aren't expected to look that way for the whole movie. Superio Makaji of Scoop Whoop discussed the issue of comparing Harley's gratuitous shots to shirtless scenes of someone like Superman or Batman. When one looks at a muscular male superhero, it is basically because one wants to have the same amount of power. It's more of a I want to be this way portrayal. With women, it's a matter of I tap that ass portrayal. Do you see the problem now? But her costume choices in Birds of Prey reflect Harley getting to look good while being comfortable, without being sexualized. For example, the high-waisted jeans versus the low-rise hot pants of Suicide Squad. When asked about the costuming for Birds of Prey, Kathy Yan told Den of Geek, it was so fun creating the costumes for them too, because it was done in such a way where it was more like dress up. This looks cute. This is fun. I like this. How do you feel in that? Are you comfortable? Do you feel good? Do you feel sexy? Do you feel empowered? Is this flattering on you? And so as much as Birds of Prey Harley still shows plenty of skin, the camera treats her differently than before, not lingering on particular body parts, or as put by Sci-Fi's Tomb regarding Suicide Squad, looking down the character with an angle that suggested a tinge of voyeurism and a specific power dynamic. In Birds of Prey, the camera feels like it works in tandem with Harley, focusing on what she wants it to focus on, rather than as an outside force peering in. Yan told the Daily Beast regarding cinematography that it was about staying mostly on the face because that's where the performance is. The narrative and the surrounding context also plays a big part in how Harley's sexuality is perceived. In Suicide Squad, Harley is surrounded by men who are all practically outfitted, so her appearance stands out and makes it feel more like something for the boys, and her character is ultimately reactionary to the men in the film, rather than having much agency on her own. And this is one of the big things that Birds of Prey brings to the table, by surrounding Harley with other women who display their own femininity in a variety of ways compared to Harley, and make her feel less ogled or singled out. But where Birds of Prey focuses on Harley's platonic relationships with the women around her, DCU's Harley Quinn dives into the one between Harley and fellow supervillain Poison Ivy. What begins as Harley's one positive, supportive friendship gradually grows into a deeper and explicitly romantic connection, arguably becoming the overall main storyline in the show's second season, after a mid-season kiss that takes the subtext and very much makes it into text. And somehow, a love triangle between Harley Quinn, Poison Ivy, and fucking Kite Man was some of the best relationship drama of 2020. The relationship is a slow burn, making sure to develop the dynamic first and get both characters into a place where it made sense. As Justin Harpern told Sci-Fi Wire, we wanted to make sure in the first season that it was just that Harley self-discovery. We felt like it was hard to do a self-discovery story if you take Harley out of one relationship and put her into another one. But even by the time the relationship takes a romantic turn, it's hardly a smooth ride that deals with the real and relatable issues of trust and commitment between two people with difficult histories and mental health issues. Harley, you run from one thing to the next, and at some point, that's gonna be me. And the truth is, I trust you with my life, but I don't trust you with my heart. It's important queer representation in the superhero medium, treating both characters as already out and dealing with very real emotional issues that both characters have to evolve with, especially when the two characters have a long history that have seen their romantic dynamic often acknowledged but rarely showcased. Harley and Ivy first teamed up in a 1993 episode of Batman the Animated Series and consistently worked together through Harley's life on page, but despite long-running undertones, they didn't officially get together until 2013 and didn't kiss on page until 2015's Bombshells and not an official main canon until 2017. Importantly, the Harley Quinn show isn't about overly romanticizing or villainizing either of Harley's main relationships in the show, but rather about exploring the emotional complications of each and about building and moving forwards. Regarding the relationship between Harley and Ivy, Halpern wrote in a post on Reddit, 
We don't really have an interest in making mistakes while they break up, and more interested in mining the idea of how the two people who love each other but have a lot of trauma from mostly poor relationships exist in a loving relationship. Birds of Prey unfortunately underperformed at the box office compared to studio expectations, with an opening weekend that drew in less than 50% of its production budget, despite generally positive reviews. There's a variety of possible reasons why, like the R rating or an unwieldy title that may have confused casual audience goers by hiding Harley's more recognisable name at the end, or there was the release date, with February being a traditionally low ending month as it is, and only compounded by sharing a release weekend with the Oscars, that normally sees moviegoers flocking to see the best picture nominated films. It's a disappointing result for a film with so much creative passion behind it, and hopefully Birds of Prey won't be the last we see of the film's characters and creative team. Margot Robbie is still set to appear in the Suicide Squad at the very least, and despite DC Universe stepping away from original programming to become solely a comic subscription service, a third season of Harley Quinn has been confirmed to air on HBO Max, so there's still no shortage of Harley and the crazy world she inhabits going forwards. Because there aren't many leads like Harley Quinn. As Katie Kuoko described Harley to EW, I think she actually represents more of the woman out there than we think. Getting away from a bad relationship and having your friends around you to make you feel powerful and believe in yourself, that's like feminism at its core. That's what I love about her. She kicks ass, she loves her friends, she does bad things but for what she thinks are the right reasons. She's strong, she's quirky, she's fun, and absolutely adorable. And in a world where we still only had a handful of superheroine-led films, Harley is a character capable of standing up alongside the big boys, who actually gets to be flawed. She gets to make bad ideas and deal with the consequences and with her own vices in interesting ways. And as such, she belongs at the forefront of pop culture. Thanks for watching. What do you think of the cornucopia of Harley Quinn related media we've been receiving these last few years? Does Birds of Prey deserve another chance to fly? And are you as excited as I am to see more of Harley and Poison Ivy's adventures? Comment down below what you think and hit those like and subscribe buttons if you want to keep up to date with what I'm talking about next. Thanks again and see you later. Wait, wait.